If you've been following along with the series so far, we have taken a look at how drag cubes are used for calculating body lift and drag, some strategies for reducing drag, and how wings are simulated. There's one final way to reduce the drag of a part. By including it in a fairing, cargo bay, or payload bay, we can reduce its drag and lift to zero. Today, let's take a peek under the hood and find out how these parts really work, starting with payload bays, as they are the simplest. If the payload bay doors are open, no further checks are done, and no parts are occluded from the aero model. If the bay is closed, we have a series of three checks, all of which must pass for a part to be occluded. First, take the X, Y, and Z lengths of the payload bay, square each of them, then add them up. If you've taken geometry, you might notice that this is the same thing as getting the square of the diagonal of the part bounding box. We then do the same for the part we are trying to occlude. If this is significantly larger for the payload bay than for our candidate part, the check passes. If it is only a little larger for the payload bay, the check will inconsistently pass based on the rotation of both parts. If both parts are rotated to face directly along the X, Y, or Z axes in the space plane hangar or VAB, they should have a much higher chance of passing. Next, draw a sphere that fully encompasses the service bay while barely touching it. The radius of this is actually set in the part config file. If the part center is inside the sphere, it passes. If it is outside the sphere, it fails. Lastly, draw a line from the center of the part to the center of the bay. If the line intersects the outer skin of the bay, the check fails. If it does not intersect the outer skin of the bay, it has passed all tests and is occluded. Note that the center of the part generally corresponds to the location of the move tool handle. Cargo bays follow the same rules with two additions. First, the two end nodes of the cargo bay must both be occupied by connections of equal node size to the bay. Note that this is not drag cube face size, but the actual size of the green attachment node. Second, if multiple bays are connected together via their end nodes, then all bays in the group of connected bays must have their doors closed. A fairing base with no panels behaves just like any other part with a drag cube, as discussed in my drag cube video, and its area can be reduced via node attachment. However, when you build a fairing body, the drag cube is dynamically updated to correctly represent the new size and shape. A wide, blunt fairing has a wide, blunt drag cube. A long, streamlined fairing has a long, streamlined drag cube. As per usual, you can reduce the exposed face area using node attachment. Interestingly, this includes the fairing's interstage nodes too, so you can reduce exposed area with multiple smaller parts rather than one large part. If the fairing has a nice streamlined profile, fully reducing the area usually isn't worth the extra mass of the parts needed to occlude it, but if you have some parts that you need to attach anyways, such as reaction wheels or probe cores, it's a handy trick to keep in mind. As for how fairings actually occlude parts, it's very similar to a service bay, but with values calculated dynamically. Just like a service bay, we get the diagonal of the fairing and compare it to the diagonal of the part we are trying to occlude. The diagonal takes into account the size of the fairing body, with one notable exception. If the fairing length is shorter than the distance to the last interstage node, the length used to calculate the diagonal is considered to be from the base of the fairing to the interstage node. Next, extend a line from the start of the fairing body to a point exactly half the length of the fairing body, then shift it 17 centimeters towards the base of the fairing. This is a quirk of the origin of the fairing not quite aligning with where the fairing body starts. Then, using this point as the center, draw a sphere with a radius equal to exactly half the fairing body length. If a part center is inside the sphere, it passes. If it is not, it fails. Notice that, especially for fairings that are short and wide, there are areas that are inside of the fairing skin, but fail the sphere check. Lastly, draw a line from the center of the part to the sphere origin point. If the line intersects the outer skin of the fairing, it fails. If it does not intersect the outer skin of the fairing, it has passed all tests and is occluded. Due to the dynamic nature of fairings, they have a few features that we have to be aware of. Regardless of the size or shape of a fairing, all body lift and body drag for the fairing panels are applied at the base of the fairing, which can result in unexpected behavior. In this example, this plane has a fuselage made up of a backwards-facing fairing that starts at the front of the craft, and the craft has a stable-looking center of lift and center of mass. However, when taking off, the plane flips as soon as it pitches up, because all of the body lift from the fairing gets added right at the front of the craft. On the other hand, this craft with a fairing fuselage starting at the back of the plane is overly stable, since all the body lift is located far behind the center of mass, making it hard to pitch up off of prograde. 
Perhaps the most valuable feature fairings have is the ability to terminate them open by holding Alt and left clicking, and the fact that an open fairing still shields parts from drag. This means an open fairing can be treated as a massive cargo bay, and parts can be decoupled and deployed from the bay without needing to stage the fairing. Fairings have an additional unintended mechanic. If a fairing is the root part of a vessel, then the drag cube of the fairing will be calculated using only the fairing base, totally ignoring the fairing panels. This results in fairings of arbitrary size having almost no drag, as long as proper node attachment is used on the front and back faces. There is one final and very recently discovered way to shield parts from drag. Any part that is node attached to one of the engine nodes of a DLC engine plate will have all drag removed as long as the end node of the engine plate is covered and the shroud is active. Notably, this holds true for any size part, and offsetting outside of the shroud has no effect. This makes engine plates a good option when you have a small handful of node attachable parts that are awkward or large and would thus cost a lot of mass to shield with a fairing or would ruin the aesthetic of the craft. Now let's look at some examples of how to use this information in practice. Two cargo bays together can be used to shield a craft that would not fit in a single bay as long as any particular part can pass the checks for just one of the bays. This fairing is absurdly short, yet still shields this fuel tank. Since the fairing panels are shorter than the distance to the farthest interstage node, the distance to the interstage nose is used instead for the fairing diagonal check, which results in a larger diagonal than the fuel tank, and since the fuel tank is centered in the fairing, it also passes the other two checks. Here, we pass a root fairing down the center of this plane's fuselage, shielding all the parts, but generating very little drag from the fairing, since it is a root fairing. This greatly improves the lift-drag ratio. Building on the root fairing concept, we use a root fairing to shield a pair of smaller fairings, which are each themselves in turn able to shield other parts. This lets us build out from a spine into a full fairing skeleton, extending drag reduction out to parts that are not on the main fuselage. Typically, it isn't worth it to go much past a single fairing spine, since the dry mass adds up fast for diminishing returns on drag reduction, but there are some niche uses where this is pretty helpful. As the culmination of drag reduction techniques, we can combine fairing occlusion and engine plate occlusion to create a truly dragless craft. We start with a DLC engine plate, attach a fairing via one of the engine nodes, attach a nose cone to the end node of the engine plate to activate the shroud, and finally we offset the fairing so that the engine plate is inside it and passes all the fairing occlusion checks. The fairing is on an engine node of a shrouded engine plate, so it is occluded, and the engine plate and nose cone are inside a fairing, so they are occluded and thus the craft generates no lift and no drag. And that about wraps things up. Between my drag cube video, wing and body lift video, and now this fairing and cargo bay video, I have presented the full explanation of the KSP Aero model as it exists to the best of my knowledge. Stick around though, because Kerbal University is by no means over, and I also plan to resume mission videos in the near future as well. As always, thanks for watching, and I'll see you in the next video.